Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Ted Barnett, president and founder of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And I'm so excited that uh, people are coming to hear our lecture tonight. This is uh, in this, our Lifestyle as Medicine lecture series. And as you can see tonight, we are uh, <clears throat> proud to present um, Dr. Jyothi Rao, who will be talking about the essential role of sleep in promoting well being. And I'm so excited to introduce you to Dr. Jyothi Rao. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from Rutgers University and her MD from New Jersey Medical School. She completed her internship and residency from Tufts New England Medical Center. And she and I have not had a chance to talk about this, but I also did my residency and medical school at Tufts New England Medical Center. So something for us to talk about later. She achieved her acupuncture training from the Helms Institute of Acupuncture at UCLA in 2000, and she completed her functional medicine training from the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine in 2013. She has been in clinical practice since 1997 and now is the medical director of Schottky Health and Wellness Center in Maryland. <clears throat> Dr. Rao is an instructor at the Maryland University of Integrative Health at the George Washington School of Medicine and a moderator at the Institute for, for in Integrative Nutrition. She has published a, a book called Body on Fire, and Body on Fire cookbook, so two books, to help guide patients with lifestyle medicine. In addition, Jyothi works with large community and business organizations to help bring education on lifestyle changes to their communities through lectures, conferences, and podcasts. So uh, Dr. Rao, if you could turn on your video, please, so we can say hello. <clears throat> and uh, there she is. Hello, Dr. Rao. And you're uh, muted there. That's okay. <laughs> okay, hi, how are you? Oh, great. How are you? I didn't know, I didn't know you had a Tufts connection. How, that's I pretty, did. I love Boston. It was amazing. Yeah. 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 Boston is great. So we're, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And, I'm very uh, excited to be here. Oh, great. Great. Um, so uh, we're going to have you talk for about an uh, Well, and, and the whole program is going to be about an hour. Uh, at, uh, when you reach the end of your um, lecture portion, we'll uh, break for Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very passionate to talk, this, to talk about this topic called uh, sleep because uh, I've been in practice now almost 25 years. And I have always felt, even though we didn't learn about this in medical school, I functioned and was just a better person if I slept better. So I didn't understand the science of it at the time. I only knew what I knew. But over the years, um, in all the training, there's a ton of data that's come out on the benefits of sleep and how it is used in prevention and treatment of chronic illness. That's kind of uh, why we're here, right? To learn about what we can do. And the, the biggest thing about sleep is that it's not just about um, being tired. Uh, sleep deprivation actually increases inflammation in our body and inflammation is kind of an itis, which is, you know, it's this, the immune system, which is trying to fight, uh, it's activating the immune system that's trying to find foreign bodies or getting rid of um, injuries that we've, with, that we've accrued, or we have, you know, cancers that we're trying to fight. All of these things generate inflammation. And when inflammation's on our skin, we see it as a rash. We see it as, you know, something on the surface, but in our body, we can see it as many different things. And those things are also seen with sleep deprivation. So I'm excessively fatigued, I'm irritable, um, moods off, anxiety, depression, poor concentration, memory changes, performance changes, hunger issues, uh, reflexes, the ability to react to something, lowering of a metabolism and worsening memory can all be linked to sleep deprivation. So yes, we're tired, but with all of these things, you know, we are starting to go on a roller coaster of issues that can really adversely affect our bodies. So this type of issue, you know, intrigued Dr. Agrawal, who's a cardiologist, um, who may or may have already spoken with you guys in the past. Uh, she and I got together. We're both from Tufts. We're both from Maryland. Um, we both, we got together and kind of put our heads together several years ago and talked about, you know, what are the tools that we can give our patients and also talk to our colleagues about to help our patients instead of the normal toolkit we get from medical school, which is, you know, medications and surgery and maybe manipulation techniques like physical therapy, um, adjustments and things like that. And that's all well and good, but there's got to be more that we can do. And why does 
our lifestyles, the way we know it now, cause us, why is there chronic illness that's going up? Why is there so much um, new, new problems coming out, like peanut allergies and all sorts of different mental issues that are going crazy, autoimmune illness that's going up? So through the literature, we've come down to everything is connected through inflammation, through this immune system. And at the end of the day, there are stressors on our system. There are stresses on our body that can look like poor sleep, mental stress, walking around anxious or depressed or fearful, worrying, uh, bad food, bad quality food, food, bad water, uh, sedentary lifestyle, which through COVID, most of us sadly have way too much of, and environmental toxins. And some of these are in our control and some of these aren't in our control, but our toolkit which is a balancer for this um, immune system is our resources, which are including exercise and yoga and clean foods and clean water, meditation, restorative sleep. And we'll go into what restorative sleep means and a plant-based diet. So when the scale is balanced, it tends to reduce the stress on our body and we can you know, go through life a little bit with less inflammation and less inflammation can lead to less chronic illness. And this is the fundamentals of what we are trying to do to prevent any sort of Ill illness, which has an itis component, which has an inflammation component. Most medical issues uh, that we deal with uh, as an internist have a component of inflammation in them, whether it's bone loss or heart disease or arthritis, you can call it heartburn, rashes, joint pain, my hair's falling out, um, you know, gout irritable bowel syndrome, all of these, the link is through inflammation. And strongly believe that the imbalance between this uh, system can also, you know, make this worse. So let's then talk about one of those tools. One of the tools is restorative sleep. And what does that mean? Um, there's many, many different um, literature searches about, uh, you know, talking about what the role of sleep is. It needs to be very confusing what sleep actually is. And to be honest, it's one of the few things, first thing that goes as a lifestyle for most of us who are busy and, you know, who kind of toss it aside and have this attitude that, you know, I'll sleep when I die. And basically, you know, the, you wear a badge of honor, sleep deprivation, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do because sleep is so critical to our wellness. And as we age from very beginning as a newborn, um, into older adult, and I'm offended about this slide that says 65 and above. I don't think that's an older adult. I think that's still an adult, but you guys know what I mean. Um, this is the um, the scale of, of, of hours of sleep. And as you can see, between a teenager and a young adult, it kind of drops a little bit. And as a young and adult, an adult, it's about still seven to nine hours of restorative sleep. Um, and even as we age, there's a myth that says that we don't really need the same amount of sleep. And that's not true. We do need the same amount of sleep, about seven to eight hours. It's just that the quality of the sleep changes. We get less um, efficient sleep as we age. And we also get, uh, we also tend to, our chronotype, which is when we fall asleep and when we get up starts to change. So at the end of the day, we still need about seven to eight hours as we age. Um, what is restorative sleep? So as we go through the cycles of sleep, there are non-REM periods, and then there's REM periods. And non-REMs are considered stage one to four, where our brain waves start changing. So when we're alert and when we're um, engaged and when we're trying to learn and when we're processing things, our brain is in beta wave mode. And as we start to relax, we go into alpha wave mode. And that starts to get us to be calmer and relaxed. And then as we fall asleep, we get into more theta and delta, which are much slower waves of sleep. And we have to go through these stages one through four and REM, which is where we kind of consolidate memories. And we can actually, um, it, te it tends to be the more, the part that causes the dreaming part, but also the efficiency of sleep changes uh, in REM. So as the sleep cycles go through the night, we start from one to four and REM, and we go through that cycle every 90 minutes. We're supposed to go through that four or five times in the, in the night. And when we wake up from that, after those cycles, that's called restorative sleep. So say you are, you know, getting up because you have to go to the bathroom, getting up because you're in pain, getting up with your, your dogs barking, whatever it is, you keep going back to stage one. So you never kind of get to that REM 
And as the night goes on, the REM becomes a larger and larger part of those cycles. So for those people who cut out their sleep at six hours, they're not just missing one hour of sleep. They're more missing a larger part of that because they're missing efficient sleep. And that sleep restoration um, doesn't happen. You don't feel well rested. You feel like you were in bed, but then you wake up and you still feel tired. And that's the kind of the thing that we want to talk about is how do we induce that that restorative regular sleep without breaking that cycle. And um, chronotypes are important to know too. I just want to mention because chronotypes are the patterns of how we sleep. So, and I didn't, this was kind of news to me because it's very important to know that not everybody is supposed to be a morning person. You can have, there's about nine chrono, chronotypes out there. And out of that, maybe five major ones where you're a very early morning person, you um you kind of wake up later in the day you, you kind of sleep later into the um you sleep later into the morning and it's important to know that if you're especially if your job is flexible because it allows you to plan your day such as workouts and maybe your most creative thinking and you know other tools that involve more of a beta wave type of an alpha wave type of a mind so that you can adjust those cycles to when you what chronotype you are so there's a test that you can find out which chronotype you are. It's called the MEQ test. And it's a morning person versus evening person test. It's online, it's about 17 questions. And it's useful to know this because uh, some people feel like, oh, I'm, I'm such a, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't treat themselves very well because they're not morning people or they, they just kind of fall asleep or they get really tired a little bit earlier than everyone. And we're genetically predisposed to these chronotypes, but they change as we get older. For example, if anybody has teenagers, you know, they're up later, they need to go, they, they need to, go to bed much later and they cannot wake up in the morning. Their chronotype will change as they go through and become adults. And then again, when we age, that chronotype starts changing. So always remember that it's an evolving issue. And so sometimes you can't get away with the things that you did five or 10 years ago because of this chronotype change. Also, what's important to know is that our bodies are built around a circadian rhythm and sunlight drives those hormones. And these hormones are cortisol, which is made from our adrenal gland and it wakes us up in the morning. And there's melatonin, which is our sleep hormone that kind of gets us to you know, go to bed and it peaks around two and 4 a.m. And then there's another one called adenosine, which kind of builds up like a pressure cooker as the day goes on. And, and the more higher the adenosine, the sleepier we can get as the day goes on. It changes when we take a nap. So I want to, I'll address that later. But when we're stressed out, when we have a lot of stress from our adrenals, um, cortisol breaks down slower so that you are less likely to sleep the more sleep deprived you are, the less likely that you're able to sleep. So it's kind of this, this mismatch that happens, but it's important to learn these hormones so that we can maybe adjust some of them. And some of the therapies are involved as well with the melatonin. Um, I put here the chronotype self-test index. It's called the auto MEQ. And it's kind of an interesting thing for people to do. Um, so this slide is to really talk about the fact that most adults, uh, about 35 to 40% of adults do not get the required seven to nine hours of sleep. About 40%, 35 to 40% of people sleep less than seven hours uh, or more than nine. And more than nine is also associated with um, negative health outcomes. And that might be because people who are unwell, people who have chronic medical problems tend to not be able to function or they're more tired than normal. But sleeping over nine hours also tends to be a little bit of a problem. But out of those 40%, 35 to 40%, about 65% of those people did not have a sleep-related disorder, which I'll get into. So uh, something like narcolepsy or something that's involved with like a true sleep disorder. Most people don't sleep because of other issues that are related to lifestyle um, or medical problems, which I'll get into in a minute. So um, these are some sleep disorders. So if you do have a problem with sleep, it's important to also address to see if you have these breathing disorders like sleep apnea, um, narcolepsy, which is where you're falling asleep during the day. It's a, it's a big problem with, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not treated the same way as just regular sleep deprivation. 
when you're jet lagged, when you're shift working, when you have advanced sleep disorders. These are other parasomnias or things like sleepwalking and sleep terrors. They usually happen in the REM period. Um, sleep related movement disorders, the restless leg, insomnia, just getting just pure central issues for insomnia or falling asleep can happen after head injuries and things like that. So these are or primary sleep disorders that need to be ruled out for most people in order to address why they're not sleeping. The regular typical medical issues that we see more commonly are things that, that wake you up at nights. For example, urination, benign prostate hypertrophy, which is enlargement of the prostate. So remember, every time you get up in the middle of the night, that cycle shift, one, two, three, four REM, it starts from one again when you wake up. So even if you're in bed for nine hours or eight hours, but you have gotten up three times at night to go to the bathroom, that cycle is not restorative because you haven't maybe gotten to the point where you're having efficient sleep. So, you know, it's really important to address things like BPH. Um, it's important to take care of things like pain. There's a lot of pain issues that can happen at night that can keep people awake. Uh, movement disorders like Parkinson's, hormonal disorders like hot flashes, and just the presence of not having enough estrogen around will, will um, change your sleep cycle. Estrogen works on the brain level, helps us think, is, is good for our cognition, but progesterone, which is another hormone that goes down in menopause, also is a very sedating, calming hormone, which can definitely, when it, when it starts to fall, really interfere with the sleep cycle, the quality of the sleep, not to mention a hot flash that wakes you up from sleep or the heat that wakes you up from sleep and then again sets you back. Um, neurodegenerative disorders like dementia, when people start to lose brain function for whatever reason, that can interfere with sleep. Sleep apnea, as we mentioned before, and there are several medications that can interfere with sleep. So alpha blockers, this is in the class of um, hypertension. In hypertension, we use some of these classes of medications like alpha blockers, but they decrease REM sleep. And remember what I said, REM gets more and more uh, longer as the night goes on. So we need to have REM in order to complete restorative sleep. Beta blockers inhibit melatonin, they, which, which sometimes um, beta blockers are known to cause nightmares. Uh, but I've also had patients who take melatonin and say they have some strange dreams with it. So, uh, but that's a big class of medicine that is used after heart attacks, for blood pressure, for blood pressure issues, but also it's used in anxiety. So, and for stage fright and, you know, things that are not maybe as dangerous, but this class can also interfere with sleep. Steroids like prednisone, which are very big anti-inflammatories that we use for many, many, many things. Uh, again, inflammation, remember, is the cause of a lot of medical problems. So anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids, we use in pain, we use in sinus infections, we can use in lung infections, bronchitis. We use it for um, you know back spinal issues. We're using it for rashes. So it's a very commonly prescribed medication that can absolutely interfere with, uh, with sleep. Even the uh, mood medications like SSRIs, the Zolofs, the Lexapros, the Cymbaltas, uh, the Welbutrins, these are of different neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin that can really, if you, if these meds can increase or change um, agitation. They're supposed to be calming and relaxing, but sometimes they do the opposite and they can increase tremor and increase impulsivity and increase agitation. Um, ACE inhibitors, and again, another class of medications that we use for hypertension can increase cough, which then keeps people up at night and it can also affect muscles. So, um, you know, movement issues that can happen. ARBs are also a class of medications like Losartan um, are potassium related. They can cause potassium changes, which is a, a electrolyte that can be um, involved with muscle changes. So cramping and um, agitation and tremors and just things that are not amenable to a good night's sleep. Cholinesterase inhibitors like acid uh, breakdown inhibit acetylcholine, but they can increase abnormal dreams. These could be things like um, mortriptyline and other things that we use for sleep, for pain, for nerve issues, for headaches. So, um, and then lastly, opiates, which are um, can cause central sleep apnea. And, and most of us know that there's a lot of dangers with giving opiates for addiction and for 
all of those issues as well. But another problem is that it can increase central sleep apnea. And what I didn't mention here were decongestants, um, things that have uh, Sudafed in them, which is a lot in the allergy medicine class. So like Allegra D, Claritin D, decongestants can also interfere with sleep significantly, as well as the stimulants like Adderall and Vyvanse and those that we use for ADHD. So what are the other things that cause sleep issues? There's supplements out there that are supposed to be energizing, that are supposed to invoke brain function, that are supposed to help our performance, um, things like ginseng, um, ephedra, there are herbals, they can it can really cause some too much energy, especially when you don't take them at the right times. There's herbs that are like adaptogens that are like cordyceps or rhodiola, which when taken properly can be really helpful, but it can, they are energizing. So you have to be careful, including things like B vitamins. Um, some people with omegas tend to be um, a little bit more alert with it. So try to pay attention if you take supplements as well. And the role of caffeine, remember that Caffeine is not necessarily bad for us. However, when you are more and more tired and your adrenals are more and more taxed and you have excessive cortisol coming around because you're on something like, you know, you're stressed out all the time, that caffeine that you drink in the morning can linger very late into the day. So that what you used to be able to get, a, you know, two cups of coffee at noon or four o'clock in the, in the afternoon, you may not be able to get away with when you're sleep deprived because it might be affecting you still, even if you go to bed at 11 o'clock. And the mis, kind of the misconception of alcohol is that it's calming and sedating when actually a lot of alcohol is stimulatory because it increases what's called glutamate in our brains as the alcohol gets metabolized. So at first it's very calming and acts like a benzodiazepine and acts on a receptor called GABA and it calms us down. But then hours later, as it's leaving our body, stimulates us by activating our glutamate. So alcohol is not actually very friendly for us in terms of sleep as well. So what happens when we don't sleep? We acquire something called sleep debt, which is the difference between seven to nine hours and exactly what you are getting. So this is most of the time. Remember that graph we talked about. It's not from it's not from primary sleep issues. A lot of it is our lifestyle choices that we're making. When you get rid of the medicines and you get rid of some of the stimulants we're on, a lot of it is our choice because we choose to work late. Everybody's down in the house and it's quiet and I just want my time and um, I'm catching up on my Netflix movies and I'm just relaxing because it's the only time in the, in the day that I can have time to myself. That's what a lot of us are doing and we're watching our TV and we're socializing and we're and we're checking our emails and our, our social media accounts. So this is, this is the problem is that we're choosing to have the sleep debt because again, the thought is that, oh, what's the difference? I'm just a little bit tired, but the truth is that it's much more than that. So remember that sleep debt doesn't just always make you just tired. Your body can actually habituate to chronic sleep deprivation, but you will see it decline in other ways. So you may not feel as tired, but you might be, your memory might be off. You might start to gain weight in your midsection. You might have, um, you know, less recovery from a cold or a flu uh, in terms of like the time that it takes. So if you start to see these symptoms that absolutely, absolutely could be the sleep debt that's happening and not just the fact that, you know, your, your body, I'm not tired. So it must be that I, I don't need any more sleep. Sleeping on, on the weekends does not reverse the metabolic problems that sleep debt causes. And we will, we will talk about what the sleep debt issues are, but just know that one hour of sleep loss, a sleep debt. So if you're sleeping six hours instead of seven, that one hour can take you four days to recover metabolically to help your body prevent the inflammation that that one hour caused. So this is what we don't want to be looking like, right? This is what a lot of us walk around with. Oh gosh, it's morning. We have to get up now. We just get through our day. But we can have like, a, again, our tools, we have a lot of tools for this. So I want to just spend a second talking about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, because again, just like the stressors and the resources that I talked about earlier, the difference between those is where we create inflammation. Our autonomic nervous system is there to protect us from that stress response that we get. And there's a specific stress chemistry that can happen when our sympathetic system, which is our fight or flight, 
is on when we have danger, when we have anything that revs us up, our cortisol goes up, our, our, our adrenaline and our norepinephrine and our dopamine goes up because we are ready to move. We need to move. We need to get moving because we're running from a tiger or, you know, thousands of years ago, this is what happened. We needed to preserve ourselves. So we get this fight or flight response. And when that scare is gone, we're supposed to activate parasympathetic. The parasympathetic is our rest and digest. This is where our rest is really critical because this is making up for this. It's like our charge rate, our battery is getting charged so that we can, again, hit the next injury, you know, stressor that comes along. But most of us, these two systems, you know, they can't be up and down. They're, they're, but they go up and down because they can't be up at the same time. So when one goes up, the other one goes down. So when the parasympathetic's up, you're calm, relaxed, your blood pressure gets lowered. It's innervated by our vagus nerve, which is a calming nerve. It lowers heart rate, lowers blood pressure. This elevates our heart rate, elevates our blood pressure, gets us out of danger. But most of us do this. We're just going on sympathetic overdrive. We're running, we're running, we're running. Our body doesn't know if we're running from a tiger when we're invoking that stress response or we're mad because we couldn't send an email or if we're sitting in traffic because we got to get our son to a soccer game or we didn't, you know, silly things that kind of get us all worked up these days. We're constantly on sympathetic overdrive. And then you throw on sleep deprivation, which lowers our charge rate. So it also sleep releases something called growth hormone, which is really important for us because it helps us heal. Not only does growth hormone make us grow, but it also, um, after a while, you know, it, it really helps in our healing response. But sleep debt increases cortisol and activates and elevates these inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, which can further exacerbate the sleep inflammation and the, our feeling of fatigue and sluggishness. So this is like an ongoing cycle. So what we want to do is work on our rest and digest. My perception in medicine is that the, the, all the symptoms are right between the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. And when we work on rest and digest, diet, sleep, mind-body connection, we start to invoke that vagus nerve. We start to match that sympathetic overdrive and symptoms tend to go away. So we really want to work on that system. What are the consequences of sleep deprivation? Aside from just being tired, it also can lead to an impact, high blood pressure. So hypertension, it causes weight gain midsection because our hunger hormones change. It can increase our, because cortisol goes up, because every time we have um, worse sleep and we have sleep debt, our cortisol, our morning cortisol is higher um, and that cortisol is also what invokes some pulling into the blood sugar into the bloodstream. Our blood sugar tends to be five to 10 points higher sometimes when we're not sleeping properly. It impairs our immune function. How many of us can remember that when you're sleep deprived, it takes you longer to heal from a cold? You get colds more frequently. You know, it's not the only thing, but it's definitely a problem that happens with sleep deprivation. It increases our um, cardiovascular risk. It can increase arrhythmias, again, for many reasons. Number one is that obesity goes up, and that's a risk factor for many cardiometabolic issues. But it also elevates, remember, our cortisol, our sympathetic drive. When this is not there, the sympathetic system is, is driving our cortisol, but also driving our adrenaline. And that left unchecked can cause things to be activated, like blood pressure, like heart rates, things like that that can set us up for arrhythmias mood disorders, anxiety, depression, um, neurodegeneration, things that are movement disorders, dementias, and even cancers have increased risk with sleep deprivation, specifically breast cancer. Um, so women who worked uh, night shifts to enter um, the fluorescent lights tend to have increased risk of um, breast cancers. So you know, these are really, really concerning. And what blew me away, what was really concerning to me was the loneliness actually has been associated with sleep debt. And the more sleep deprivation we have, the higher the loneliness. And we know now that being lonely, especially with all the COVID issues that have happened, have increased our risk for other medical problems. So just by being sleep deprived, there's an increased risk for loneliness. You create more of an isolation feeling. So um, why does sleep cause um, obesity? Well, sleep deprivation can activate hormones um, like ghrelin, which is, in, which is inducing our appetite. 
And sleep deprivation also decreases another hormone called leptin, which gives us satiety. So you are now increasing hunger hormones and you're lowering um, your sense of satiety. And overall, you're increasing hunger. Also with sleep deprivation, you're increasing the timing that you're staying awake. So you have more opportunity to eat, which then increases your caloric intake. It also kind of lowers our metabolism and it increases our energy, decreases our energy levels. So you're less likely to exercise, less likely to be, um, you're more likely to be sedentary. So you're having increased caloric intake and reduced energy uh, expenditure, which then can lead to um, storage of energy, which can look like fat. And a lot of that fat storage tends to be right in the midsection. And that tends to be very, very, very inflammatory. And that particular risk factor is associated with many metabolic problems, including heart disease, diabetes, um, and metabolic syndrome. So remember that, um, so diabetes, I don't know if you can see this slide properly, sorry. Um, there's a direct link between um, the chance of you getting diabetes with the amount of hours that you're sleeping. So, you know, if you are sleeping less than seven hours, you have an increased risk of diabetes. And if you're sleeping more than nine hours, you also have an, an increased risk of impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes. So the other big thing that we want to keep in mind is safety. Um, our decrease in alertness definitely can happen. They've They've done studies that, that show that the sense of few days of sleep deprivation of six hours or even five hours, uh, people's performance can be equated to that of if they were inebriated. So uh, there's more workplace errors and there's a higher risk of auto accidents. So it's not safe for us to be sleep deprived as well. And we don't perform as well. We're not as efficient. So that leads us to what do we do about this, right? So um what about naps? And naps are very, very, um, they're controversial in the sense of like, it's not the same for everyone. There can definitely be pros and cons. It can be supremely refreshing to take a 20 minute nap and it can help our learning, our memory and help our cardiovascular status. Um, the cons are that, remember that hormone that tends to, bu to build as the day goes on, the adenosine tends to build, it's like a pressure cooker. Um, if you take a nap, you just diffuse that pressure cooker. So sometimes you're so sleepy, you take a nap, you wake up from the nap and you don't, you can't sleep at night. So that adenosine is gone. So if you're that person that feels like a 10 minute, 20 minute nap during the day, you know, is not, it's not good for you because again, you want to sleep at night. Why? Because of those stages, those four stages and REM need to happen multiple times in the night for us to be recharged and refreshed. So if you have a nap and that interferes with it, then I would not take a nap. Um, if you're struggling with sleep at night, please don't nap because I think it does take away that adenosine pressure. But if you're able to do it, great, because it can make a big difference in terms of your functioning if you can still fall asleep at night. Um, sleep is also an antioxidant. So everything and everything that kind of could be injurious to our body, like even sunlight and pollution and sitting too much and, you know, not being having stress in my mind all the time is an oxidative stress for our system. It's a stress stressor that needs an antioxidant. We know that one of the best forms of antioxidants is fruits and vegetables. The bright colors that's in um, fruits and vegetables and spices are incredible antioxidants. But glutathione, which is made from our liver, is the strongest antioxidant in our body. And five days of sleep deprivation can reduce that production of the antioxidant uh, by 30%. And it can, you know, they looked at this in the HIV population and they saw that there was many, many issues about this that started to affect their immune system. But if you were able to make up for that sleep, um, you could actually show sleep recovery by on the weekends for people to be making it up. That glutathione came back. So you absolutely can have a system where you can make up for it. Our bodies are super resilient. It wants to heal. We just need to give it the right tools. So what are the, some of the things you can do on a daily basis? You can um, stick to cooler temperatures. So 65 to 70, uh, 67 degrees, that is tends to be the time. Now that's really cold. So you have to, uh, or your partner also has to agree, but anything that tends to be cooler is going to help you sleep. The biggest thing is to stick to a schedule. Please, you know, 
try to go to bed at the same time most days and wake up at the same times, again, it can vary based on your chronotype. You may not be the person that you know sleeps at 10, gets up at six. You may be someone who likes to get up earlier or goes to sleep a little bit later, but know that if that cycle you can do at least five days a week, it would be very beneficial for you. Um, sometimes warmer extremities, some people like to wear socks and gloves, even though the, the body temperature is colder, the extremities being cold sometimes makes people sleep unwell. So, you know, you may need to wear socks. Um, this, oh, let's see what with this was dark. Yeah, of course, having a dark room, um, a cold room, you know, I have people sometimes wear um, masks so that they can, you know, we get more and more sensitive as we age to the small, small amount of light that's coming in. So keep, keep in mind that a dark, cold room is very important. Also, don't stay awake in bed and stare at the ceiling or look at your clock or do anything like that. Get out of bed if you wake up. Don't stay awake in bed because then you start to create this sleep anxiety. So use your bed only for sleep and any other activities that you only do in bed. But do not stay awake and stare at the ceiling. Start watching TV, read a book. Don't do anything like that when you're trying to get on a better sleep cycle. Avoid caffeine and alcohol because we talked about why. Um, they both can be stimulatory. Um, and then they can also last longer than you think. So just be careful when your last caffeine intake was if you're having some sleep issues. Also, exposure to dark is great, but in the morning, exposure to light first thing also helps that circadian rhythm for us and helps our sleep, uh, sleep cycle stay very consistent. And a quiet room without LED lights um, is also very important. And LED lights on your, um, on your technology can also be an issue because the light can tell your brain that it's not time to go to sleep and the melatonin doesn't go up as fast. So, so avoid you know, LED, um, your technology before you sleep. Um, this is a little, uh, one of my favorite things to do, sun salutations, whether it's in the morning or at night. It's a great way for your body to stretch out and use those muscles that are the opposite of what we do when we sit. And that sitting position holds on to a lot of tension. That tension can prevent us from sleeping restoratively or well. So these stretches tend to be um, all using the muscles that are, again, opposite of what we, when we're sitting, all our extensor muscles. You don't even have to do all of it. You can just do some of it, but a nice stretch at night before you go to bed. And with each pose, when we're doing sun salutations and yoga, we tend to breathe in and breathe out. And when we tend to breathe out long exhales, you start to invoke that vagus nerve, which slows us down. It slows down the heart rate. It slows down the blood pressure. So even doing a few of these postures. I love standing forward fold. I love backwards, upward salute. You know, any of these things, if, even if you don't want to get on the ground, they're really helpful right before you go to sleep. Um, and that's not to mention also the role of exercise. Exercise is a phenomenal help for sleep issues. So the more you exercise, the walking, it's not going to a gym, it's just movement. It will help you sleep better if you exercise. So stand more, um, sit less, just as a simple concept and stretch if you can. And in your sleep routine, you know, um, stretches, meditations, deep breathing, again, anything that invokes that vagus nerve, anything that calms down and adds to our parasympathetic, our rest and digest. Remember, rest is also calm mind and body. So things like yoga and meditation and avoiding things that are very stimulatory, like the news, for example, like that's the horror show you don't want to watch at night before you go to sleep highly engaging activities, even if you start to say, oh, I haven't checked my Facebook today, but oh my gosh, look at this, what this person's doing, what this person's doing. That's an engaging activity, you know, so you don't want to necessarily look at your phone, not necessarily for the LED light or the blue light, but it's because of the engagement that you're doing and telling your brain that it's not time to sleep. Remove all clock faces in the bedroom. It triggers anxiety because you wake up and you're staring at, oh my gosh, it's 2.05. Now it's 2.10. Now it's 2.15. So you don't want to be looking at clocks. And there's also something called anticipatory anxiety, which is the thought that when I wake up, my phone is going to have a to-do list for me. I have 20 emails to check in the morning. So get into the habit, if you can, of not looking at your phone the first thing in the morning, because even if it's, you know, I'll say 30 minutes. And if you say, that's crazy, I have to look at my phone at some point, you know, do your morning routine, try to go down, get your cup of coffee, whatever. And maybe look at your phone 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, but you start to train your brain that, that that's not the first thing you're going to look at, which is 
sometimes just a bunch of issues that start to engage you, maybe rile you up and worry about all the things that you have to do that day. So maybe not check your phone first thing in the morning and maybe start something like a wind down routine. A lot of people know what a morning routine is, but I like to talk about a wind down routine. And a wind down routine can involve breathing, something as simple as four, seven, eight, where you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, you exhale for eight, it just calms your body down. When you exhale longer than you inhale, you start to invoke that vagus nerve and you just calm down. There's a yoga that's on your back. It's a guided meditation. It's called Yoga Nidra. And it's on most of the apps that we that you talk about for um, calming, like Calm and Insight Timer. Um, you can find this anywhere. There's some um, binaural beats are these um, sounds that you can get online that actually change your waves from beta to delta to theta based on the sounds that are coming in. It's incredible. It actually works really well for sleep. Aside from sounds like the ocean and things like that, binaural beats are wonderful. Um, my favorite thing is Epsom salt. If your kidney functions normal, if these salts have trace minerals and magnesium, you can soak your feet in a bucket with them. You can get in a bath with them. But the, it's a very calming, ritualistic thing you can start as part of your wind down routine. Um, warm liquids like teas, if you don't have to go to the bathroom, you have to be careful if that starts to make it worse. And then maybe a small snack before bedtime. Sometimes in people, they get hypoglycemic, low sugar. So you want to be able to um, have maybe some almonds or things like that. If you need to, I wouldn't encourage it unless you think it made a difference. So you lower your cortisol, um, have some resources here that talk about the belly breathing, yoga for the brain, um, different types of meditation, transcendental, mindfulness-based stress reduction, art of living is a, um, a program that teaches you different breathing techniques. These are some of the apps that are out there and then the binaural beats. So. Um, also, there's a ton of technology that helps us sleep. Um, one big thing is obviously if you have sleep apnea, um, that's a medical issue that actually makes you stop breathing and oxygenating at very small, minute amounts during the night. And it adds up over time and you need pressure in your airway to kind of keep that open. And that's called a CPAP. So you may need some tech, you may need that in order to fix the sleep apnea. Some people will say, well, just lose weight. You know, you'll fix your sleep apnea if you lose weight, but sometimes you can't lose weight because sleep apnea holds on to your low metabolism. So you're going to have to wear a CPAP in order to lose weight to get rid of the CPAP. Um, there's wearable devices called Alpha Stim and the Muse. These are technologies that you wear that increase alpha waves in your brain that make your brain more, more coherent, which means it brings the left and the right side of the brain together. And when that happens, it calms it down. And the Muse uses sounds and does a biofeedback for your brain to say what your brain's doing. So it's, it's really cool technology. Um, Aura ring is also something that people like to use because it's a ring that you wear, it quantifies your sleep. And so it can tell you how many hours you're sleeping and it shows trends because it shows up on your, on your smartphone. Um, obviously things to mask, you know, masks and earplugs block out noise and block out the light. There's even, um, remember we talked about the vagus nerve, there's actually vagal stem TENS units you can use to have relaxation and calming. A smart mattress that changes with you in terms of the tension and the position and those kind of things. And my, one of my favorites is a weighted blanket or a cooling blanket for menopausal type issues. You can have blankets that cool you down and you can also have blankets that, that weigh on you that are really helpful for sleep promotion. Um, so the other issue, you know, we talked about initially was that the, you know, it is a really big deal. Sleep deprivation is affecting our children as well. And there's a CDC advises that, you know, we want to teach kids very early the role of importance of sleep. And the American Association of Sleep Medicine says that, you know, start times in high school should be 830 because in that age group, they still need a lot more sleep than seven to nine hours. Um, they want to push the curriculum in, in medical schools to teach about the, the role of sleep and sleep disorders. And they recommend that primary care start screening for sleep disorder because it is so uh, involved in so many of the medical problems we see every day. And we also need specialists to know what sleep looks like because not sleeping can affect your gut, it can affect your heart, it can affect your brain. And all those subspecialists need to also know that it's not just medications, it's also the role of sleep that can help with those kind of issues. 
So again, with treatments, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of going over, but um, CBT tends to be the first thing. This is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's considered first line. Um, it's more, um, it, it does more than just any medications. And if we do use medications, it should really be short term. Um, there are these uh, non-benzo medications like Ambien um, and Lunesta. These are the brand names. These are not addicting per se, but they're habit forming and they can be really difficult to get off of once you start using them on a regular basis. Benzodiazepines, the Xanax is the volumes, very dangerous. They are associated with fall risk. They're associated with memory loss. They're highly, highly habit forming. So we really need to be careful when we are using them. And you have, if you have to get off of them, you have to do it through a provider and do it very slowly. Um, melatonin is a hormone that actually used to be a prescription, but what happens with melatonin is something called tachyphylaxis, which it stops working after a while. Um, just like Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, used very commonly for sleep issues, including hospitals, but it does have a memory loss implication that shouldn't be used long-term. And then there's a new class of um, orexin receptors, which uh, block this awakeness receptor that we have which is also a controlled substance. So not such great options for medications, which is comes back to some of those lifestyle tools that we talked about. The cognitive behavioral therapy is an excellent choice for someone who has insomnia. Okay, so I hope that people are still awake. Um, you know, so um, I will, these are some of the sources, the references for the American uh, Association of Sleep Medicine. They have a ton of development issues for professionals as well as for patients. They have a, a lots of lots of resources for identifying sleep problems as well as tools to help. And then there's this for the Aura Ring, which I've been impressed with in terms of quantifying sleep patterns and having people watch their sleep. So this is what I wish for all of you and um, I'll take any questions. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. No, absolutely. And um, I, I'm sure we, I know we already have lots of questions. Maybe you could stop sharing there. And uh, uh, Dan, uh, our medical student, is going to help us field some of the questions. What have we got, Dan? All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the first questions that we got was, is it possible to measure our cortisol level? Yeah, so you can measure cortisol level. Ideally, it's thought through the saliva or the blood for at four different times in the day because in the morning it peaks and as the day goes on, it goes down. So it really depends. Most hormones have a cyclical cycle. So it's really dependent, really is important to when you measure it, that you want to measure it at least four times in a day because it's not only the level that's important. It's if you, if you at least come down like this. Some people stay high the whole day. Some people stay low the whole day, which are not good for you. Dr. Rao, could you uh, stop sharing your screen that we get a, oh, sorry. Get a well, I'll get a bigger view of you that, uh, that way. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, what else, Dan? Yeah, so we have two other questions that are related, so I'll combine them. Um, the first one is asking about recommendations for people who complain of waking up in the middle of the night. And the other question talks about using TV as an aid in the middle of the night when you wake up to fall back asleep? So um, the first one for people who wake up in the middle of the night, I'm assuming it's not from pain or needing to go to the bathroom or those kind of issues. That is the type of person that I would wonder whether their sugar is dropping at night, um, whether a small snack like a small, um, like almonds or um, a, a fruit with nut butter might be helpful to try to see if they can sleep better because sometimes a drop in sugar in the middle of the night will increase cortisol and wake you up. Um, that's also the time that I use extended release melatonin sometimes because it's melatonin helps people fall asleep, but doesn't necessarily keep people sleeping. Um, so maybe the role of extended release melatonin could help. Um, and the second question was what I'm sorry, it was uh, using TV as an aid to fall back asleep in those situations. So the only problem with that is sometimes the TV, I mean, I, sometimes it's background noise that helps. So you could get something that has, um, I love binaural beats instead for that. That's when the sounds actually can help people fall back asleep. Sounds of ocean, sounds of other things, because you can't really control sometimes what the TV has on. So I'm not a big fan if there's like something that's going to engage you or 
has, it's not so much the LED light issue because that's not, the light doesn't really matter when it's that far away, but it's just the thought that it couldn't matter. I mean, we it couldn't matter that the light's coming at you so that now you're, you're the back of your eyes with the rods and cones are seeing light. So your melatonin starts to fall. Um, so maybe try to figure out what is it about? Is it the sound? Is it, um, does it, can you have binaural beats instead or some sort of ocean sound or maybe even like a background noise that is like a hum, you know, what we used to use for, we use for babies, um, a low level sound that maybe help better than a TV. Hmm. You know, for sound, one of the things that I use, uh, cause I like to hear either rain, uh, there you can um, use um, um, Spotify actually. There are some rain noises on Spotify. So we have a family subscription to Spotify. I just put it on a continuous loop with a little speaker next to my- That's a great idea. It's fantastic, yeah, yeah. Um, doc, we have a, a question from a physician. Dr. Graf asks, can you tell us more about the Vegas 10 stimulator uh, and how do I get a patient set up for this? I can, I'm happy to send you some um, information on it. I myself, um, I use TENS unit in my, um, TENS unit like things in my acupuncture treatments, but there is, um, may I send you guys a link on it after, because sure. it's a, there's Me a too. whole write up on it and um, where patients can purchase it and all of that. And I can share that with you. Um, maybe can I can you, send it to Brian after. Absolutely. Can you explain Yeah, we can uh, send an email to everybody who attended. Can you just explain uh, what the apparatus actually is for the, it, I think it Vegas. clicks to your ear and okay. um, it, it, let me see if I can find it. The, the, the TENS units are, they're different. They're from different companies, but they are okay. things that can clip onto a ear that can start to invoke that vagal response um, with a certain frequency, just like some of the other things that we use the TENS unit for. So the, mm -hmm. it does have to clip onto a part body part mm -hmm. and it can mm -hmm. relieve, uh, it can give out a certain frequency that can start to calm down that vagus nerve. Um, I have not used it separately. I've kind of just used it as part of my treatments, but I've recently learned that people can use vagal tens units to uh, purchase at home and, and do that. So I can send that information to you guys. Got it. Dan, what else do we have here? Yes. Yeah, so next, we have a question about the timing of exercise. How long of a time, time gap should be weighted between exercise and bedtime? So most of the time, you know, you want to match your exercise with cortisol. So again, cortisol peaks in the morning and comes down at night. But for some people, they can absolutely work out really hard and go right to bed and go to sleep. It doesn't affect their sleep at all. My preference is that people work out in the morning, but I would rather see them work out than not work out. So if you can work out in the evening, not right close to your bedtime, but if it doesn't affect your sleep, it almost doesn't matter when you work out as long as you're able to fall asleep and stay asleep. But if you're someone who can't, you know, works out at five and you're fine, but you work out at 8 p.m. and you can't sleep that night, then you have to be someone, then you have to change that workout routine. Ideally, I would say in the morning, but not everybody has that time in the morning. Mm -hmm. The next question is, uh, what kind of specialist should I see uh, for help with sleep deprivation coming from someone who doesn't have any medically related causes for the deprivation? So the this is the person that I think the cognitive behavioral therapy would be really suited, well suited, and that's a therapist. So, um, you know, trying to go through, um, at first, maybe a primary care to rule out anything that you may not know is happening, uh, medically speaking, just to kind of go through that checklist, make sure you're not taking any medications or stimulants, um, just to kind of get a full work up on it. But then the next step I would say is the cognitive behavioral issues. If you've tried some of the lifestyle stuff that we talked about today. Right, I know somebody in the Q and A asks about um, whether this lecture will be available. And yes, uh, in, in about 48 hours, we'll be sending everybody a link and this will, this has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel, uh, especially for those of you who missed the beginning. Okay. Who else? Um, since we talked about CBT, um, where do you send people for CBT? Where is like an initial resource someone can go to? Yeah, this is a great question because, um, you know, normally you have to work through your local therapy groups because not every therapist is skilled in CBT, especially with sleep therapy. So um, the American Association of Sleep Medicine has a website and they claim, and I've tried to find it, they claim they have a section on CBT trained 
professionals for sleep. It's a really, it's an excellent resource, number one, but I have not found that section on there. I've only used local therapists in my area. Um, and just like anything else, it's like the, it's it has to be a fit with that person. But I start with my local groups um, who do psychiatry and therapy and and. Some of the sleep centers have therapists as part of their um, their ongoing care for patients, but it's very individual based on your location. Mm -hmm. so, Dr. Rao, can you comment on the, some of the wearable devices and how useful they can be for assessing how well you're sleeping? Sure. I uh, yeah, I had a one. slide on it, but I didn't spend too much time on it. So they looked at um, the wearable devices like watches and rings. Um, there were six of them that that did in the study, and I can share that link with you guys too. But it it looked at, um, but it did correlate. They compared it to a traditional sleep study, and what it did show was that the actual sleep time that people slept correlated pretty well, about eighty to ninety percent, with the sleep study. So you can quantify how much sleep someone's getting, but you can't quantify the stages of sleep they're in. Um, but oftentimes, what happens is that key patients kind of sense from the aura ring is what a lot of my patients have. Um, they kind of can sense that some of the like the better days, oh, and they can track, oh, I worked out this day and I slept better. I, you know, I didn't eat so late and I slept better. And so they're, they tend to be able to track the reasons why they didn't sleep well. And sometimes there's no reason, but um, it, it allows people to kind of create their pattern for their lifestyle to create optimal sleep, because which is why I like it. But it doesn't necessarily tell you what stages and REM, it doesn't correlate that as well as a sleep study, but the time of sleep, it correlates. Right. Uh, someone asked, is the doctor taking new patients? Well, uh, Dr. Rao, where are you located? I'm in Maryland. Um, in Maryland. Right. Yeah. Uh, so um, you'd have to make a trip down to Maryland uh, <laughs> unless you did telemedicine. Um, we do have excellent uh, sleep uh, doctors in Rochester, I can attest to that. Um, so, um, we can go over a couple of minutes because we have quite a few questions here, but we'll, uh, we're almost, almost out of time. Um, oh, someone says you take insurance. I'm in Maryland. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this person's being pretty, pretty persistent. I think she wants to see you, Dr. Rao. Yeah, I, I'll share, I mean, my information, but, um, yeah. I do, I, I'm, I am not on Medicare or I don't take insurance right now. Right. What else do we have there, Dan? Next question is asking about um, if the hours of sleep before midnight are more beneficial than the hours of sleep after midnight. So because of the quality of sleep that gets better, you know, there's more REM. The REM becomes the larger part of the cycles later in the night. I feel like the later part of the night is more efficient as opposed to the early part but you can't necessarily negate the early part in order to get to the later part. You know what I mean? You have to go through those cycles. So um, if you had to pick one, I would say the later, but I think you need it all. Hmm. Next. All right. well, um, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. You have another one there, Dan? Yeah. Um, any recommendations for partners who have different sleeping schedules? Yeah, that's tough. Um, the thing that I would say is maybe um, if it's like one of those smart beds that you can't feel the other person getting in and out because you can actually do dual mattresses and they can be individualized. So you can't sense the movement. Also wearing earplugs and maybe even a mask if the lights were turning on. That's probably the best you can do um, because it, it it can be a different, you know, difficult problem, especially if there's different chronotypes. One person's a later person, one person wakes up early. But um, I am, I've been impressed with something called the ghost bed. I think they sell them at Costco, but they're like these almost um, almost like hospital beds, but they, they, they go up, they have anti-gravity positions, they, but they're separate, two mattresses. They don't, they don't link to each other. You can sit them right next to each other. Uh, Dr. Rao, do you have any final comments for people? Any suggestions for... Uh, for um, I would people? really encourage people to think about starting a evening routine. Um, just as a wind down. And it's, it seems kind of crazy because everybody's so busy, but it makes such a big difference to um, even start with, say, some Epsom salt soaks or read a book or listen to some sounds or even breathing, maybe a sun salutation, one small thing to add before you sleep because it can really change the quality of your sleep. I think that's really good advice. Thank you so much. Thank really you. It. Yeah. And Dan, thanks for helping out uh, to, our, to our engineer. 
Bob Frankie and Brian Bell, both of you, thank you so much. And to my staff, uh, thank you all and have a wonderful night. Bye. Good night. Bye.